Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I'm Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. We have here some uh, distinguished guests who have not been here before, and therefore it is important that together we recite <laughs> our inspiring mantra so that they will be uh, buoyed up for the rigorous tasks ahead of them. Ladies and gentlemen, the National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Was so inspiring. Wasn't that a wonderful <laughs> job? It was fabulous. It really was. We could do an encore, in fact. Uh, there was another movement that inspired support on a nonpartisan basis at the turn of the last century, and that was the eugenics movement. The science of better breedings. Ladies and gentlemen, you were wise to come tonight because you were about to hear from uh, four of the leading thinkers in America on the history and constitutional significance of this dark period in American history that reminds us that enthusiasm for new technologies, uh, which seem uh, forward thinking in their times, may have effects that history will come to condemn. It's an astonishing story. We're gonna hear, we're gonna start with excerpts from a really important new film about the eugenics movement that I can't wait to share with you. And then we will hear from the producer of that film and three of America's leading uh, legal scholars and historians about the eugenics movement. I must tell you, friends, that just today I saw uh, an advanced tour of the new Civil War and Reconstruction Gallery, which is opening next week. It is so thrilling. It's so exciting to be able to see Dred Scott's freedom petition with his X underneath. John Brown's pike, the flag that flew over Independence Hall when Lincoln said he'd rather be assassinated on this spot than abandon the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And this amazingly moving series of three interactives about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments where you can touch the text, the individual clauses, see the early drafts as they evolve through Congress and hear stories about the leading protagonists and heroes who fought for the task. I found it overwhelmingly moving. I think it's gonna be a very, the most significant permanent addition to the Constitution Center since I started in 2013, and I can't wait for you to see it. It opens next week. And then we've got a great series of panels with uh, Reconstruction historians on May 20th, and lots of other phenomenal programs to end the town hall uh, series. So before we begin the movie, I want to thank Mary Morgan uh, and Andrew Kimbrell and Paragon Media, who shared their very important film, A Dangerous Idea, with us. We're about to see excerpts from the film, and then we will discuss them. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, this is Lauren's first plane ride right here. We was raised in a very rural area of North Carolina where there was hardly jobs or any work, and the only form of work that was there was farming. We used to go and pick cotton or potatoes or beans or something like that. Instead of us being in school, sometimes we had to be in the field. I remember, um, you know, my hair was unkept. You know, I used to wear the same thing over and over and over to school at least three times a week. You know, I was really an unkept little girl. Like many people growing up in North Carolina in the 50s and 60s, Elaine Riddick Jesse never had the real opportunity she'd been guaranteed as an American citizen. Her fate was bound up with a state built on a system of segregation and Jim Crow laws. The Windfall community suffered in extreme poverty. Elaine watched her parents' marriage fall apart, eventually leading social workers to send her to live with her grandmother. Then, Elaine's life took another tragic turn. I was a victim of rape. I was molested when I was 13 years old. And the guy that raped me told me if I told anybody that he was gonna kill me. You know, and um, so I had to keep it to myself. Eventually, the social worker noticed that Elaine was pregnant, assumed that she was promiscuous, 
and recommended that Elaine be examined by the State Eugenics Board. The Eugenics Board was a board of five men that sat around a table, and of course, they were white men, too. They sat around a table, and they just marked the paper. Anybody that the, that the social worker would deem feeble-minded or slow or having a problem, the social worker would come in and say, I want this person sterilized. And boom, they stamped it, and that was that. The board was presented with an evaluation from the social worker, who insisted that there was no hope for Elaine, that she got along poorly with other children, and that an IQ test showed that she was feeble-minded. No one asked me, what's wrong? Can I help you? Are you hungry? Are you cold? You know, maybe I'm sick. No one took the time to find out what was the problem. Elaine discovered the board had completely ignored another evaluation they received by a psychologist who said her chief problem was her environment. She was doing above average work in school, and any difficulty she had getting along with others was likely due to the fact that she was always being bullied by other students and was generally hungry. The board favored the social worker's recommendation. I had my son and I woke up in bandages, not knowing what it was for. They went inside of me and sterilized me without my knowledge because I was black, poor, and my mother was in a prison. My dad was running around. He was an alcoholic. My mother was an alcoholic. So they automatically assumed that I was going to become an alcoholic. And then without even my son as a baby, automatically assuming that he was the third generation and that he was going to be an alcoholic also. What they wanted to do was nip it in the bud right then. Stop this family tree. They want to cut the tree down. And I want to know who in the world give these people the right to go and do these sort of things to another human being. You know, even in Germany, you didn't have the, Hitler didn't have the right to do this. We are the ones that educated Hitler on this stuff here, sterilization. My interest in eugenics certainly comes in part from the experience of myself being a refugee from, from Hitler and being keenly aware of what was done in the name of science and specifically in the name of genetics. But that happened in this country as well, of course, in a certain sense. The Nazis imported it from the United States, which had a flourishing eugenics movement. At the turn of the 20th century, eugenics was widely accepted in the United States as solid science among the country's top psychologists, scientists, politicians, and social thinkers. During this first Gilded Age, it was the creation of the gene concept itself that ignited what became a powerful eugenics movement. So one reason that the eugenics movement was so influential at the time was because it provided a scientific solution or a supposedly scientific solution to a political problem. The Gilded Age was the first time in American history in which you had people sitting on top of the entire economy. Vast fortunes made on the backs of average people. At the same time, a new wave of immigrants coming into this country with nothing. And our cities became fetid slums in contrast to the extraordinary wealth that the robber barons, as we called them, were enjoying. We were in danger of losing our economy and our democracy. People forget in 1900, there was no middle class in America. In 1900, there was no weekend in America. There's not one single paid holiday. We had this extreme laissez-faire, social Darwinist reality, and the vast majority of Americans were fighting to change it. People took to the streets 
held massive general strikes, demanded better living and working conditions, and an end to laissez-faire, unregulated capitalism. If that's the explanation, then the true way to fix that is to pay higher wages and to uh, give people a better environment in which to live. And it was clear which explanation would be preferable to the captains of capitalist industry in the early 20th century, and that is the biological explanation. The wealthiest families in the country provided millions in research funding to scientists in an attempt to prove that social problems were primarily a result of defective genetics. At the prestigious Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, Harry Laughlin, an animal breeder, directed the eugenics record office. He claimed they could predict who would inherit good or bad traits by using a mathematical formula from Mendel. They were also firm believers in Charles Darwin, who clearly applied his theory of natural selection to human society. Eugenicists saw themselves as agents of evolution, doing their duty to ensure that the fittest Americans survived. They said, we have to find a way to have people who are more evolved make more babies. We have to find a way to have people who are poor and who have all these diseases and all this bad genetic structure produce less. Laughlin organized exhibits in communities across the country to educate the public about eugenics. Families underwent detailed physical and mental examinations as they competed to win the prize for the best heredity. But eugenicists disagreed on what should be done with people they considered unfit. Some argued that laissez-faire economic policies might be severe enough to eliminate so-called defectives from the gene pool. Society should not coddle in any way the poor. Don't help them. Don't help them through charity. Don't help them through legislation. You see, if you help them, according to the social Darwinists, you would only enable them to reproduce more of them. Society would be better off if we instituted survival of the fittest. We would get stronger, just as species become stronger when their weakest members die off and their strongest members live on to reproduce. But it would take decades before this social Darwinian approach would be effective. So many eugenicists considered a quicker solution, one that would eventually be used by the Nazis, euthanasia. Some called for outright execution of the unfit, as well as lethal neglect of newborns they considered defective. But in the end, they agreed that euthanasia would be used at too dear a moral price. Sterilization was the favored alternative. Biologist Harry Laughlin wrote the model law that North Carolina eventually used to sterilize Elaine Riddick. He called for millions of people he considered defective to be forcibly sterilized, as well as relatives who might be carrying supposed recessive genes for inferior traits. In 1927, the Supreme Court upheld Harry Laughlin's model law and ruled eight to one that the Constitution permitted U.S. citizens to be forcibly sterilized. Congress never passed a federal sterilization law, but it's estimated that by the end of World War II, under state laws, at least 80,000 Americans had been forced to undergo hysterectomies, tubal ligation, vasectomies, and castration. It was only in 1933, after the Nazis took over, that Germany had any eugenic laws at all. 
the first law they passed was for the heredity of future generations, and that was their sterilization law. And they modeled it on Laughlin's model law. In fact, they were so grateful to Laughlin for his leadership in this area that they gave him uh, an honorary medical degree from Heidelberg in 1936 for research on purifying the germplasm of the human population. Laughlin was an enthusiastic supporter of the Third Reich. The eugenical news which Laughlin edited just fawned over Germany and its progressive policies. And in fact, there was a certain envy. Germany is getting too far ahead of us in applying the conclusions of science to the structure of society. The most significant similarity was the emphasis on racial purity. Strict control of immigration was crucial to eugenic goals. In the 1920s, Congress debated whether to impose racial quotas and hired Harry Laughlin as a special agent to investigate the subject and offer his recommendations. Laughlin particularly wanted to shut out Eastern and Southern Europeans. Immigrants were being castigated as low-level people, as the dregs of humanity. Words like this were used in publications as prestigious as the Saturday Evening Post. And the call was very strong politically and economically to restrict immigration. What Harry Laughlin provided was charts of data that he took to the Congressional Committee, purporting to show that people from Italy, from Poland, from the Slavic countries, were genetically inferior to the Northern European, to the Nordic, the Aryan, the Anglo-Saxon. And that this genetic inferiority was going to have a major impact on future generations in the United States. Laughlin presented data from supposedly objective IQ tests that immigrants were forced to take at Ellis Island upon their arrival. Laughlin neglected to mention that many of them were reeling from the crowded two-week journey they just made across the Atlantic, trips that were often marked by sickness, sleeplessness, and hunger. If they didn't do well on math problems or abstract image or writing tests, immigrants were marked with an X, declared feeble-minded, and deported. And they used eugenics arguments that people who were coming in had these bad genes the Congress passed overwhelming legislation to limit the capacity of these groups to come in. Even when it was clear that Jewish people were being persecuted by the Nazis, they were a central target of the racial quotas and were denied entry into the United States. In some estimates, up to two million Jewish immigrants who died in the Holocaust might have escaped their fate if Congress hadn't passed the racist law. In 1939, nearly 1,000 refugees escaped and sailed all the way to Cuba, hoping to eventually enter the United States. They were stranded in the waters off Havana as they awaited news of their fate. Families rode out to the ship hoping to get a glimpse of their loved ones. But the Cuban government turned them away, and the White House was silent. The refugees were forced to return to Europe as the Nazis expanded their occupation. The same year, a bill was introduced that would have allowed 20,000 children, most of them Jewish, to come to the United States. Foster families were ready to take them in. Laughlin and other members of an anti-Semitic coalition lobbied against relaxing the racial quotas for any reason. The bill was defeated, leaving the children no escape from the hands of the Nazis. The widespread rejection of Jewish refugees convinced the Nazis that other nations shared their views of Jewish racial inferiority. Since being Jewish was considered to be an inherited thing, you couldn't convert away from it. The only thing to do to rid the body politic of that burden was kill people. And that makes that worst crime of history a piece of bad science, among other things. 
When Hitler was elected in 1933 in a free election, one of his slogans was, all politics is applied biology. Okay, and that's the red light that one has to see on the road and not go down that road, ever. of sitting idly by and watching my husband's dream turn into a nightmare. And so the forces appear to be joined, the poor people declaring that they have declared war on the administration's efforts to cut off the war on poverty. Despite the controversy, the administration was able to move many war on poverty programs out of the Office of Economic Opportunity to other agencies and cut funding by more than 50%. However, Nixon did expand federal support for a war on poverty program he felt very strongly about, birth control for the poor. The people in what we call our class control their population. The people who don't control their families are the people that shouldn't have kids. As part of its birth control effort, the administration quietly distributed a memo to federal clinics across the country, informing them that, for the first time, war on poverty funds could be used to cover the costs of sterilizations. It was a program that became abused because the people at the top who were distributing the money never bothered to issue the rules and regulations that would have made sure that adult women and men who were interested in family planning and interested in contraception could get what they wanted. And instead, it became a program that for many people resulted in forced sterilizations. Joseph Levin filed a lawsuit against the Nixon administration after he discovered that two young girls, Minnie Ralph, age 14, and Mary Alice Ralph, age 12, were sterilized at a clinic in Montgomery, Alabama. At no time prior to the surgery did any physician discuss with the girls or their parents the nature or consequences of the surgery to which Minnie and Mary Alice were about to be subjected. The girl's, the girl's mother was given a consent form by the doctor. He knew she couldn't read, and clinic workers pressured Minnie to sign a consent form, falsely stating she was 21. Dr. Warren Hearn, working at the War on Poverty, develops these guidelines. And these guidelines say that no one can be sterilized without informed consent, and there can be no coercion. So these guidelines actually would have prevented the sterilization of the Ralph sisters. But his guidelines were never delivered to the clinics. They were being held up at the White House. So I got a call from Dr. Cooper telling me that I must refrain from any contact with the White House or OMB. Uh, and I said I was just trying to do my job and find out the, where the guidelines were. My attempts to find out about them were met with hostility, harassment, attempts at intimidation, and pointed invitations to resign. On Finally, he realized they weren't going to distribute them, and so he quit. So these guidelines were never distributed to clinics. Even the 200 copies that Dr. Hearn had himself were taken out of his office and put in a safe place. And in the following investigation about what happened to these guidelines, the White House responds to the questions by saying, it suited our purposes. It suited our purposes to suppress these guidelines. We came to learn that maybe there were as many as 500 of these clinics functioning throughout the United States. And it was sort of up to the nurses and the doctors as to who got what. And they made their judgment about who was worthy and who wasn't. We are suing HEW for non-enforcement, non-monitoring of the uh, sterilization regulations 
We are also seeking consent forms in Spanish and I'm talking about the deprivation and the genocide of American Indian people. I'm talking about our women, 42% who were sterilized from 1971 to 1975, and not a whimper from this, of, of indignation from this country. The U.S. District Court judge who resided over the Ralph case found that during the Nixon administration, nearly 400,000 poor people were sterilized without being fully informed. There was evidence, the judge said, that an indefinite number had been coerced into operations under the threat of losing federal assistance. Many others were sterilized without their knowledge. It almost sounded as if we were talking about some Nazi era plan. It really was a practice of eugenics because these clinics didn't see anything wrong with controlling the birth rate of people who they viewed as a burden on society. It's that simple. The hospital after three days. The Ralph lawsuit resulted in Judge Gerhard Gazelle requiring the federal government to issue stringent guidelines on sterilization, and that included a ban on the sterilization of any minor, anyone under 18. So what we have here is a real triumph for the Ralph family. They take this case all the way to federal court in Washington, D.C., and they say, you know what? This happened to our daughters, but we're not gonna let it happen to anybody else's daughter ever again. And after this litigation, they win. And this stops the entire second wave of sterilizations in the United States. Wow, well, Andrew, congratulations on that extraordinarily powerful movie, which both conveys with detail the history of the eugenics movement, makes clear the connection to the Nazi horrors, and then, although, ladies and gentlemen, you realize there was a cut in between the part about the Nazi era and the Nixon era, ends with this shocking story that uh, I had not heard about. So tell us about what it was like to discover the Nixon program and how much you contributed to uh, revealing about it and uh, what you hope the audience will take from learning about it. Yeah, and just quickly, the, uh, the name of the full name of it was A Dangerous Idea, Eugenics, Genetics, and the American Dream. And I'm one of the executive producers, the other is Mary R. Morgan. We are part of this amazing team that put this together. And I'm also co-author with the film's director, Stephanie Welch. So it was a, a tremendous creative team that put this together. We, I had written a book on this, Jeffrey, and I did not include the Nixon material. I really found out about it while we were doing this movie. And we didn't intend to make a through line between Hitler and Nixon, but you know, it, it is what it is, you know, as far as the sterilization is concerned. So it really was shocking because we always talk about that 80,000 you know, that were the victims of that first wave that goes up to about World War II a little bit afterwards. This, we're talking about 400,000 and we're talking about targeting almost entirely people of color and women of color mostly. So it, it actually dwarfs the first wave and yet it has been, pretty much been hidden from our history, partially because I don't think people want to hear about it. And second, it was ha happening at exactly the same time as the Watergate hearings. So it got kind of taken out of the news, literally month by month as this was going on, the Watergate was going on. But I think it shows us that um, you know, eugenics is, and I think we'll be discussing this, eugenics is not something of, of, of the past. You know, this fundamental idea, the difference, particularly from the Anglo-Saxon white male, the difference always equals deficiency. That if you're not a white Anglo-Saxon male, as you saw, you're deficient, right? Versus saying our difference is, is our diversity and our diversity is our strength. That's the dividing line. Difference from a certain ideal is deficiency that has to be dealt with and through the main tools for sterilization and immigration restrictions. Or we celebrate our diversity because in that, even as people know ecology, we know that diversity is fundamentally our strength. That's, the, that's one of the dividing lines you see. Um, superb, so powerful, and I'm so glad uh, that we had a chance to see this excerpt from the film. I was so eager to start that I jumped in without introducing our panelists, so <laughs> let me uh, remedy that by uh, introducing them, and then we'll continue uh, this ex extremely important discussion. So Andrew Kimball, is, as you know, is executive producer and co-writer of a dangerous idea. He's also the founder and executive director of the Center for Food Safety and a public 
interest attorney. Daniel Okrant on the left is the prize winning author of six books, including the book which will be released next week, The Guarded Gate, available tonight for early purchase. Daniel Okrant, of course, is one of America's most distinguished uh, commentators, journalists, and historians. He wrote the definitive book on the history of prohibition that was the basis for our prohibition exhibit here at the National Constitution Center. And we are extremely honored to have him in his first appearance about this book. He'll be back in Philadelphia next week to talk to Terry Gross on Fresh Air. And we're really lucky to have him here at the center. Uh, Paul Lombardo is Regents Professor and Bobby Lee Cook Professor of Law at Georgia State University School of Law and author of many pathbreaking articles, including definitive studies of the Buck v. Bell case, which you heard about, and which we'll delve into uh, more closely. And finally, our great friend, colleague, and neighbor, Dorothy Roberts, is George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology, and the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander Professor of Civil Rights at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. She is also founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society in the Center for Africana Studies and the author of many articles that are relevant to our topic uh, today, including one that I just learned so much from, uh, Race, Gender, and Genetic Technologies, A New Reproductive Dystopia. Please join me in properly welcoming our panelists. <laughs> De let's begin at the beginning, as the movie did. And Daniel, you're over there, so you can start us off. There, there's so much to talk about in this history, but give us a sense of the political and legal context that produced that North Carolina law that the court upheld in 1927 and Buck and Bell. I'm always stunned by the statistics, so I'll just put them on the table when we begin. Uh, legislatures in 16 states between 1907 and 1933 passed laws authorizing the sterilization of defective people, defined loosely as idiots and imbeciles. During the next five years, seven of the state sterilization laws were challenged as unconstitutional by opponents of eugenics, and lower courts struck all seven of them down on the grounds that they were cruel at our usual punishment or they violated the equal protection by allowing sterilization of people in state institutions but not others, or that they violated the due process rights as we saw ab about those, uh, those remarkable sisters who had no opportunity to challenge their designation. Nevertheless, the states continued to pass the laws. Uh, 14 more states passed sterilization laws between 23 and 25. The Supreme Court upheld them in the Buck and Bell case, 1927, and then the floodgate was opened and uh, as many as uh, 13 more states adopted sterilization laws after Buck and Bell, bringing the total to 30. It wasn't until the 1942 Skinner case in the middle of World War II that the Supreme Court began to question these laws, but they remained on the books until, as we saw, uh, the 1980s, and as recently as 1985, the sterilization of the mentally uh, uh, challenge was allowed in 19 states. Uh, I hope that wasn't too long an intro, but those statistics are striking. So Daniel, give us a sense, please, of how this remarkable movement started, why it was considered a, a progressive uh, movement, and how some of the leading lights of American progressivism supported it. Well, I'm going to hand it off to Paul shortly, because this is really his specialty. Uh, but I'll go way back, if you don't mind, which is to say, uh, to the publication of Origin of the Species in, in 1859 and the Darwinian Revolution, which changes the nature of the way that science is perceived, particularly in the UK, and then it spreads to the US as well. Uh, it, it is the first real challenge to the, what has come to be known as the creationist view uh, uh, of our origins. And it subtly buried within this revolutionary and, as we know, you know absolutely valid notion is the idea that we're not all derived from the same people. We're not all derived from Adam and Eve. And if we're not derived from Adam and Eve and we're not related, some of us are better than others of us. And it was a, the idea of eugenics itself was something that was formulated by actually a first cousin of Darwin's named Francis Galton, a very interesting and peculiar gentleman scientist of the 19th century who 
Uh, he did studies of, uh, he did a beauty map of England where he figured that the least attractive women in, 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 in the UK were in Aberdeen, Scotland. Uh, he conducted a series of studies called the uh, frequency of fidget where he would watch people in an audience and he'd note how often they fidgeted under what circumstances. He did some important things like uh, fingerprinting, uh, 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 statistical analysis. These were all uh, among his creations. In 1883, he named eugenics and his idea was primarily what came to be known as positive eugenics, which is improving the species by finding the best and having the best breed to the best. An idea that goes back to Plato, obviously. Uh, but in his particular case, his, his first major recommendation was that uh, the uh, UK would find the most talented, uh, handsomest, beautiful, uh, most morally upright young people and match them up in marriages. And there would be a wedding ceremony in Westminster Abbey pre presided over by Queen Victoria, and then all of these couples, 5,000 couples, would get a certain amount of, uh, I think it was 3,000 pounds a year for life, so they could get busy doing to what, what needed to be done, making a better England. That's the beginning. It gets distorted. It comes to the U.S. basically around 1900 to 1910. At, at Cold Spring Harbor, we saw the, the, the laboratory there. I think that I'll step aside now and hand the ball off to Paul and catch it later when we get to the immigration aspect. So fascinating. Thank you for uh, that remarkable introduction. So Paul, you've written an acclaimed study of Buck v. Bell, and I must say there are a uh, few uh, uh, books uh, that receive the accolades that uh, yours uh, has, but uh, it's been praised as the finest study of, of Buck v. Bell that exists. And Buck v. Bell is infamous for, uh, as we saw uh, in the movie, Oliver Wendell Holmes' uh, statement, it's better for all the worlds if we cut the fallopian tubes rather than uh, allowing uh, degenerates to reproduce. Three generations of imbeciles is enough. Eight to one, the only dissenter is Pierce Butler, a Catholic. Uh, tell us about why the case was eight to one. And, the, and the, these are progressives from my hero, Louis Brandeis, is joining this decision. Uh, another hero, Chief Justice Taft, who, as uh, Daniel writes in his book, vetoed a 1913 uh, immigration bill, because he was pro-immigration, but nevertheless saw the case as constitutionally uncontroversial, set the stage, the legal stage, for why this was an eight to one decision, why Butler dissented, and what else we should make of the Buck v. Bell case. Well, I'll start with Carrie Buck. Carrie Buck is the main character in this, in this drama. <coughs> Carrie is a 17-year-old girl in Charlottesville, Virginia. She finds herself in the unfortunate position of being pregnant. Um, the baby's father has disappeared. Uh, she is turned out by her foster parents. Her own mother is nowhere, nowhere to be found. And she uh, eventually, very quickly, is sent to the Virginia Colony for the epileptic and the feeble-minded down in Amherst, Virginia, just south of Charlottesville. Uh, she meets her mother there. She finds that she's also been committed. Um, Carrie is designated, as her mother was, as being feeble-minded, uh, being sexually promiscuous. You'll see a pattern here as these cases come around. Being someone who couldn't control herself and who would have children just like herself. Uh, she was called a moral degenerate because she did have that baby and she wasn't married. And then a, a Red Cross nurse uh, visiting sees the baby and reports back, there's something, something peculiar about it, I don't know what it is, but there's something not right there. And based on those observations on Carrie's situation and on her mother's uh, being there at the colony in, uh, near Lynchburg, um, she is chosen to be the test case for a brand new law which goes into effect just as she arrives in the summer of 1924. Virginia passes this law really as a way to protect uh, the doctor who wanted it written. Uh, he had been sterilizing people for years, but uh, got sued, didn't like that, wanted immunity, wanted to be able to do what he thought was right, particularly to get those women off the streets, people like Carrie Buck and her mother. And so Carrie goes uh, um, really like a lamb to slaughter. She is really only a 17-year-old. She is... is uh, has gone to school for about six years, done reasonably well, but she has no one to defend her. They appoint a lawyer to defend her, pay him quite handsomely. Uh, the case goes to the trial court there in Charles, excuse me, in um, Amherst, Virginia, and the judge finds that in fact the law has been uh, adequately written, that she has received due process, she was represented by a lawyer, and therefore that the law is constitutional. 
It's then appealed, and it goes to the Virginia Supreme Court, which in turn also endorses it. Um, the lawyers who brought this case were very concerned that it not be overturned, and they wanted to go all the way, so they took the case then to the United States Supreme Court, where it was met, as you've just heard, by some real luminaries, uh, certainly Justice Taft, who the only, the only justice, Chief Justice who had ever been President of the United States. We're not likely to see that again. Um, he, he, was, he was met by, um, he was met by uh, uh, Justice Brandeis, of course, was also on the court. A number of other justices that you've uh, probably never heard of um, who are less, less famous, um, but the one that you have heard of is Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., really known as the god who had come down from Olympus to his, to his admirers. You've heard lots about him. He gives us the great phrases of constitutional law about not yelling fire in a crowded theater, among other things. And so when this case comes through, he also uh, gives us a line worthy of remembrance in describing the Buck family, very briefly talks about Carrie Buck, uh, one of the poor, shiftless, uh, poor white trash of the South, she's called in some of the court papers. And so he, pointing out her mother's problems, um, her own purported uh, deficiencies, and the comments made about her baby, he says, the law seems to be constitutional. It does all that we can in matters like this. Uh, we have a statute. We have a we have precedent from the from the vaccination cases. We can vaccinate people. Well, if we can vaccinate them, we can sterilize them. And he draws a line under all that and says of the Buck family, uh, three generations of imbeciles are enough. And so Kerry becomes the first person of some 8,000 who were sterilized there in Virginia, and as you've already heard, uh, thousands more around the country all the way up until the 1980s. We Thank were talking about that, that it's just, you know, before the, the president said, it's just remarkable. The 1905 vaccination case, right, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, the right that was being violated there, that the police power of the state was held to be sufficient to ensure the welfare of the community, you need to be vaccinated for smallpox in those days, right? But your complaint was, that's an error because I don't want to be vaccinated. That was what its issue. That Oliver Wendell Holmes felt that that was legally equivalent to having your basic right of procreation taken away in one sentence is, you know, Paul, you had a great, you said it may be the most extraordinary anomaly in, in, in Supreme Court history that he would make that association. But it didn't seem to have any difficulty making the leap between vaccination and sterilization, and even less difficulty uh, justifying the fact that this was really a, a attacking what later became known as a fundamental right. Um, the issue in the case, though, was whether or, not the, whether or not due process would allow for a state to pass laws like this, uh, laws that would um, um, allow someone to be represented, allow someone to challenge the order of the state, uh, and to challenge the evidence that was put forth uh, against them. Holmes says that's what laws are supposed to do. We, we execute people, we send them off to war, people die. The state has the power to do that, and if that's something we can do. We can certainly ask people like Carrie Buck for these lesser sacrifices, as he said. Uh, and so the case was really about uh, due process. Holmes said she's gotten due process. Um, that's all you get. Um, the case has many more turns in it, which I won't burden you with now, but it was a sham. Her lawyer was literally working for the other side, and no evidence was put into the record to support Carrie's um, lack of problems, for that matter. She was, she was a perfectly... Uh, um, healthy young woman, uh, not that that would have justified what happened to her, what, not, that, not that if she were disabled it would have. Nevertheless, there was, this case was a fraud. Dorothy Roberts, if I could. Um, Holmes was an enthusiastic eugenicist, and after the case came down, he went back and wrote to his friend Harold Lasky, this morning I upheld the law mandating the sterilization of imbeciles. Nothing I've done all week has given me so much pleasure. On the other hand, the whole, it was an eight to one case. It was constitutionally uncontroversial. The court hadn't yet recognized a right of autonomy. It took the 40s to bring that about. As constitutional lawyers, was Buck correctly decided at the time? Or what are we to make of the fact that no justices, except for the conservative Catholics, seem to find it constitutionally problematic? Well, I think what you have to understand is that they accepted eugenicist logic. And that's why it was easy for them to disregard the harm to Carrie Buck. If they thought that there was a great harm to her, 
then they may have ruled differently. It, the reason they focused so much on procedural due process is because they didn't see any other problem with the statute. And the reason why they didn't see any harm in sterilizing Carrie Buck was not only because Holmes thought it was the best thing for society because he had bought into eugenicist thinking, but also he argued it was good for her. His main argument was that it is better for feeble-minded people to be sterilized now than for their children to end up in prisons and to starve to death because it, it was assumed that they, because of their defective genes, they were going to become these people who couldn't survive in society. And so the way he framed what he was deciding was something that was to her benefit. And in fact, on the equal protection claim, which was a claim that it was unequal to, uh, to sterilize people who were confined to public mental institutions, but not people who were in private ones. That was the equal protection claim. Holmes said, well, we're doing good for these people. So if the government wants to do good for the people in, mental, in public mental institutions and not others, that's okay. Again, they didn't even see it as the, a classification that harmed the supposedly feeble-minded people who were being sterilized. And, and he said, look, once we sterilize her, she could leave. And so they, t they twisted the idea that you would put someone in this institution in order to sterilize her into if we sterilize her, we're doing her a benefit and now she can go freely into the world without the fear that she's going to produce another generation of imbeciles. And so you really have to wrap your head around this logic that turns government oppression into a benefit for the very victims of its oppression. And that goes back to, that's one of the reasons why eugenicist thinking is, is so dangerous, because it can even make it seem as if violence against people is not only good for society, but it's good for them. That's a very vivid uh, way of putting us in the shoes of these progressives and helping us see how a law that seems to us the greatest of all constitutional dignities would be uncontroversial to them. And you remind us that if you accept that logic, you almost do need some notion of a fundamental right to personal autonomy in order to resist the law, and that just was not part of the doctrine at the time. Yes, that's right. And I don't think that's an excuse, though, because it could have been an opportunity to create it in that case. So yes. uh, that, that's not, it, it could be that the court would have decided that even though the state had the police power to impose vaccinations, that this wasn't the same as just forcing someone to undergo a vaccination. So there were, would be ways of distinguishing it. Again, it's the, this dangerous logic of eugenics that blames people who are actually the victims of inequality for their position, you know, that says you're the threat to society, not the people who are creating these unequal structures in society. That's a very important point. It could have gone the other way. And indeed, all seven of those state courts did go the other way exactly. before the Supreme Court exactly. heard it. So there yeah. was really a shameful moment in the Supreme Court's history. I, I think Dan, so. Dan, 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 you remember, there's no science here, right? They don't say in Buck v. Bell, right? right? They, they don't say, here's the science, here's the molecular biology, here's what we know. They go, experience, this is the term they use. Experience teaches us that this must be hereditary. Yeah. Remember, this is 1927. DNA was not even discovered until 1953. All of these crimes that were done in the name of the gene were done with no science. There was no scientific basis for this. It was an idea that there must be something in the body called a gene that they had not found any embodiment that must be causing all of these things, which makes it to me even worse that, there were, that they did this sheerly on prejudice. They didn't even have science to back it up. Dan Daniel, um, uh, take us back to the immigration law of 24, three years before Buck and Bell. Why did it pass? What were its consequences? And how did it influence the Nazis? Well, let me back up a, a bit and, and, and elaborate on something that both Dor Dorothy and Andrew have said. Um, there was science. It was just junk science. But it was promulgated by the leading scientific institutions in the country. It came out of Harvard and the American Museum of Natural History and the Cold Spring Laboratory, sponsored by the Carnegie Institute of Washington and at Princeton. 
Uh, the people behind it, the, the, the president of MIT in the 1890s, you know, was, he began by saying that the people of Eastern Europe, they lived like swine. They were swine. They weren't the same as people. It was this perfect marriage of really what was at that time the progressive ideal. Government using its grand authority and the, the, the brilliance of science to make society better. And it was then quickly distorted. Uh, and you think of the people who supported eugenics to vary, varying degrees. We saw Margaret Sanger's picture up there, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, Edward A. Ross, not remembered today, was a socialist. Oh, Norman Thomas supported eugenics uh, to, to a degree. Edward A. Ross was a, a very close friend of Senator La Follette of, of Wisconsin. He was a head of the American Sociological Association. He was later the national chairman of the ACLU. And he said at one point about the uh, Slavic people that they will endure, endure conditions that a white man could not survive. And it was this notion of a separateness uh, of certain racial groups that led to the immigration law. I jumped way ahead. 1916, a book is published that brings together the anti-immigration movement that has been bubbling for years and the eugenics movement, which is just coming into public prominence, uh, a book by a horrible and fascinating man named Madison Grant. And bringing these th two things together, it changes the notion of eugenics that not only must we set, keep that individual with the X uh, on, on his jacket out of the country because he's blind, he's deaf, he's feeble-minded, epileptic, but all the people of his race, of his ethnicity are as well. So in 1924, this comes to a hideous head, um, prefigured by a statement that appeared in, of all places, Good Housekeeping magazine in 1921 uh, that said that uh, now that biological laws have proven that the Eastern and Southern Europeans are inferior, we have to keep them out of the country to protect our bl bloodstream. Author Calvin Coolidge, about to be sworn in as vice president. Mm. By, by 1924, the science that isn't science is so widely accepted that in the case of the, Sup the Supreme Court justices, they don't even look at it. And in the case of huge majorities in Congress, they accept it. And if you read the debate of the time, which is a very, very discouraging debate, it is the American bloodstream, the American purity, invoked over and over and over again. There were 226,000 Italians on average who came into the US in the three years before the 1924 law. The quota reduced it to fewer than 4,000 a year. And it did the same to all the Eastern and Southern European groups. Wow. Um, what was the um, legal change that led from Buck in 27 to the Skinner case in 1942, where William O. Douglas, noting the Nazi atrocities, recognizes an equal protection argument against the sterilization laws, and maybe say a bit, if you will, about the influence of the uh, American laws on the Third Reich. Yeah, you. That's you. <laughs> That's me, OK. Yeah, vote. It turns out that um, the Buck case really turns the tide. As, as Jeff said earlier, the direction of the law in the states was going against eugenics, was certainly going against sterilization. Um, Buck case changes that, and many states pass laws in the wake of, of the 27 decision. Um, and everything gears up for sterilization uh, going into the late 20s and certainly into the early 30s. Uh, it turns out by the early 30s, as, it's, as we were told on the film, um, Hitler comes into power and makes this the very first thing that he wants passed. So his law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring is passed in 1933, goes into effect in 34. Um, there is a direct line between certainly Harry Laughlin's work both in the Buck case as well as in the Nazi law. Um, many people are sterilized and then the war breaks out. Uh, 39, uh, the, the Second World War breaks out. 42, the United States gets in and lots of doctors are sent off. People are starting to question to a certain extent whether these laws work the way the eugenicists told them that they did. Um, but it doesn't stop sterilizations. The case comes to the United States Supreme Court um, from Oklahoma. Uh, a challenge to a sterilization statute that, that uh, allowed for, mandated the sterilization of recidivist criminals, people who were repeat criminals in the prisons in Oklahoma. The prisoners challenged this, a uh, fascinating case by itself um, because it involved some, some great characters. Uh, it gets to the Supreme Court at a time when America is starting to realize what's going on in Europe. 
There are reports of, of uh, people being killed. There are all kinds of reports of atrocities. And the Supreme Court justices are very aware of this. The case is assigned to Justice uh, William O. Douglas. Um, Douglas has a full um, um, package of material that he can draw from for arguments. And he decides really on his own to focus on equal protection. And he says, here we have a criminal from Oklahoma, Jack Skinner. And Jack Skinner has been sent to prison for um, one of his crimes is he's a chicken thief. He stole chickens. Um, the Oklahoma statute that allows for him, mandates for him to be sterilized, says that you can, if you, if you have these felonies, which was a, a theft of more than $200 at the time, you are, um, you are liable to being, to being taken into the operating room. Uh, Jack Skinner's lawyer opposed that and pointed out that there were, there, were, there were gaps in the law, there were exceptions. If you violated prohibition, that didn't count. You could still drink. Um, if you were an embezzler, that didn't count. If you had committed some kind of political crime like bribery, well, that didn't count either. Um, so there were certain crimes that were penalized with sterilization and others not. And uh, Justice Douglas seized on that point and said, what is it that's different from being a thief and stealing a chicken and being a clerk and sticking your hand in the till in the bank. He didn't seem, he said there's no, there's no logic in science or, uh, or for that matter jurisprudence to make that distinction. The, the thief in the bank goes free, the chicken thief is sterilized. This is not fair. This is a violation of, of equal protection. Uh, the undertone of the, of the case court really was echoing what was going on in Europe, echoing the notion that, that uh, and, and this comes up in one of the concurring opinions, echoing the idea that uh, unequal application of the law based on class was also something that the sterilization laws uh, violated. And so the Skinner case strikes down the issue of sterilizing people in prison while it lays, it leaves on the table, the idea that feeble-mindedness, as they say, is different. And the Buck case is never overturned for that reason. Uh, uh, Judge Dorothy, was, was, in that sense, was Skinner uh, decided as persuasively as it might have been? After all, the law does distinguish between different types of crimes. Should it have found an autonomy right instead? And how does it fare in retrospect? Well, Douglas does have in dictum a statement that procreation is one of the basic civil rights of man. And he also points out that in certain government hands, sterilization could wipe out an entire race of people. That's not the basis of the holding because he does not hold that this violates the substantive due process fundamental right to have children and therefore doesn't overturn Buck versus Bell, but it's got great language in it, at least, of this recognition of the importance of procreation and the political weapon that can be used against whole groups of people by deeming them inferior and appropriate subjects of state sterilization. So the there's good, strong language in it. Of course, it's good that the court struck down this obviously biased law, uh, but um, it could have been a stronger case if the court explicitly struck down Buck v. Bell on grounds that eugenics sterilization violates a fundamental right of human beings to have children. That would have been a different kind of case and would have been a stronger basis for challenging other grounds for which the state continued then to sterilize people against their will. And of course it wasn't until, uh, as you suggest, it wasn't until later, until the 60s in the cases like Griswold versus Connecticut that the court yeah. begins to recognize a fundamental right to procreation which culminates in the line of cases uh, that uh, include Roe versus Wade. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Um, Andrew, the court strikes down the sterilization law in 1942, but as we, the film shows so vividly, sterilization continued. The Nixon story is shocking and not well known, but uh, many of us did know that sterilization laws remained on the books until 1985, if not longer. So tell us about what happened from the 
40s through the 80s and how all of this continued under the radar screen. Yeah, just as a quick, uh, uh, on the Skinner case, it was a three strikes you're out. If you had three felonies <coughs> that were 20 bucks or more, you get sterilized. If you have a white, so it was blue collar crime versus white collar crime. Blue collar, you get sterilized. White collar, oh, you're fine. Political crimes and the same. Hmm. And actually, one of the concurring opinions, Judge Jackson, who later became uh, the chief prosecutor at the Nuremberg trials, he actually uses a wonderful expression in his concurrence. He says, We cannot have these biological experiments by a dominant class on one that is not dominant because we risk basically being what we're seeing in, in Nazi Germany. So, and he later became a chief prosecutor in the Nuremberg trial. So just a little side thing on the Skinner case. That's, I teach it, and in the case book, they don't excerpt the Jackson opinion, and thank you for calling our attention to that. That was yeah, incredibly just, impressive. Uh, so remember, we're talking states, right? We're talking, these are all the states that did it, right? We never had a federal law, as we say, in a dangerous idea of the movie. We, we, we never had a federal law. So Nixon's faced with a problem, which is that during the Great Society, they found that uh, the aid to families dependent children was actually not being administered in a legal way in the South. They were not allowing many, many women who could have been, and families that could have been helped, help because they didn't want to give them the money because they wanted them in these low paying jobs. So hundreds of thousands, over 300,000 new people on the welfare rolls because of that. Well, Nixon gets into power in 1968, that terrible year of all the assassinations and everything else then, on a horrible year. And he says, we gotta do something about welfare. Well, here's one answer. Take women who are on welfare, whether they be uh, Native American communities or you know, uh, African Americans, and say, unless you stop having babies, you're not gonna get your welfare check. So for their very first time, they say, as you saw in the movie, you know, listen, we're gonna be using these, these funds to sterilize people. And, and then we see coercion, you know, we see people who are not having informed consent, and people are actually against, well, this is the first federal, federal sterilization, not state now, federal. And it goes across the country, and the guidelines that Dr. Hearn, that actually would, that would have prevented the great abuses, were actually held back by the White House. We don't know what their purposes were, but they just said our purposes. Election was coming up, were they afraid of that? We don't know, but it's because they didn't go out. The, the, wealth, the, the Southern Poverty Law Center, by the way, was the, got a hold of this case, and they actually filed the litigation. When they filed the litigation, there were no regulations yet. They were still being in that warehouse. So all of the first questions they ask are questions of due process. They're constitutional questions. Well, Weinberger, Casper Weinberger, who then was head of human health, health and Human Services, he says, oh, we don't want to do the constitutional questions. That could overturn Buck v. Bell, by the way. Then we could really get into some serious trouble, right? So he says they quickly get these you know, sort of ad hoc regulations in place. No one near is as good as the first ones. So then the case doesn't become about the constitutional questions. It becomes about the adequacy of the regulations. See how they, you switch it from these big questions to whether Weinberger's, and of course, Gerhard Gazelle, uh, you know, in, in DC, uh, discourse says, these regulations are terrible. These regulations don't really protect anybody. You're not gonna put, be able to spend a single dollar more until you get, give me good regulations. And it took a couple years, but finally those regulations came into place. So again, these constitutional questions that would have overturned Buck v. Bell never were dealt with by the court. The court said, I don't have to deal with those because I can just deal with this by dealing with these regulations. And the final regulations did, thankfully, say no minors, you know, no people that, for, for because of any, any particular being mentally challenged, they, they can't be sterilized at all and had uh, fairly strict consent requirements for adults um, because of that Ralph case. It's stunning. Uh, you could teach a course, of course, on Nixon and the Constitution, but you've given us an entire <laughs> new uh, seminar week to I, I, I uh, emphasize. I wrote a book on this uh, about 25 years ago. I didn't even include the Nixon. <laughs> I didn't include because I wasn't even aware of it. It was only in making this movie that we that the team became aware of this, and it's really shocking that it's not better known. Saving Buck v. Bell is a remarkable uh, ambition of the administration. Paul, you wanted to jump in. Well, I, I'm not so sure that that had the Supreme Court dealt with this in Ralph versus Weinberger, which was '74, um, it didn't get to the Supreme Court. But had it gotten there, Roe versus Wade was in '73. I'm not sure that the Roe court would have been any happier with uh, overturning Buck than anyone else was, because in fact, Buck is last cited in a footnote in Roe versus Wade as being one of the exceptions to the general rule of reproductive freedom. Before, um, D D Dan, Dan, you end the book around the 1930s and around the Holocaust, and this is Holocaust Remembrance Day as it mm -hmm. happens. So before we you know, end uh, too much in the present, I'd like you to tell us what else you want us to know about the influence of the eugenics movement on the 
Third Reich, uh, the surprising stories you found about enthusiasts for the movements, including the celebrated editor Maxwell Perkins, and, 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 and what else we should know about this really well, shameful uh, period of history. Just briefly on Perkins, Do, how many people here know the name Maxwell Perkins? Uh, the most celebrated publisher in American history, the editor who brought this Gerald Hemingway, Thomas Wolfe, uh, and so many others uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the world's attention. Uh, Perkins graduates from Harvard in 1907, and his first job is working in a settlement house in Boston, teaching English to Russian and Polish, largely Jewish immigrants. Um, he then finds his way to New York, gets hired at Scribner on the recommendation of one of his Harvard professors who says to Charles Scribner, I knew all four of his grandparents. End of recommendation, hired. <laughs> Uh, in 1916, Maxwell Perkins is handed a ma this manuscript by Madison Grant, the man I mentioned before as being so peculiar and so wonderfully interesting. Um, and he edits the book called The Passing of the Great Race. The key paragraph in that race, in that book, says uh, that the marriage between any of the two, uh, any two uh, different uh, of the um, European ethnic groups. Uh, will always revert to the lower. So if a Nordic marries an Alpine, the child will be Alpine. If an Alpine marries the disgraceful Mediterraneans, the child will be a Mediterranean. And the marriage between any of the three European groups and a Jew produces a Jew. Uh, this was really kind of the key moment in the, in the, in the, uh, the, the merger of the anti-immigration movement um, and the eugenics movement. And it became a, uh, so broadly accepted, the people, I mentioned Coolidge's article before, it was accepted science by all but a very few people who did speak out about it, primarily the anthropologist Franz Boas, but they were ignored because the credentials, that was another part of the progressive movement. Credentials meant so damn much, and the credentials were there. Perkins went on to publish many such books in, in uh, Scott Berg's prize-winning biography of Maxwell Perkins, this isn't mentioned, not a word of it. It's history that, like so much that's been discussed, so much of what Andrew's shown, just gets shoved under the carpet, the people who were involved in doing this sort of thing. Um, it's, you know, I spent nearly five years on this book, and living with these people was not fun. Um, they're not charming. Uh, they did some horrible things, but it's a story that we need to know. We really need to know. And, and many of them were charming, but just monsters at, yeah, at monsters. the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I could just add one dimension to this, in addition to the marriage between eugenics and anti-immigration was the marriage between eugenics and white supremacy and Jim Crow. Jim Crow was arising as the regime in the South and a kind of regime like it, although not enforced by law in the North. And the, in 1924, when Virginia passed the law we've been talking about in Buck versus Bell, on the very same day it passed the Racial Integrity Act that barred white people from marrying anybody other than a white person. And that kind of hierarchy you mentioned at the very bottom of it was black people. So if any of those white people married a black person, that was the worst crime. That would be the mongrelization of the white race. And so it's, it's really, really important to see how eugenicists that were enforcing policies that were supposed to improve society by keeping certain people from having children were arm in arm with white supremacists who were also enforcing policies to keep a pure white race and to, which was of course linked to keeping black people separate from white people. And talking about US Supreme Court cases, the latest one, even after Skinner versus Oklahoma, was Loving versus Virginia, which the US Supreme Court didn't pass and didn't hold until 1967 was when it finally struck down bans on interracial marriage. And so that's even later. The, the hesitation of the US Supreme Court to touch interracial marriage is evident in correspondence among the judges and also in the litigation strategies because Southerners were so averse to the mixing of the races. 
And so it, I just want everybody to see these connections Absolutely. between anti-immigration, eugenics, and white supremacy, all of which we can see in politics today Absolutely. as well. It, yeah. it, it's a crucial point, and you're so right to stress the fact that the court waited uh, th more 13 years from 1954 when Brown versus Board of Education was decided until Loving because Felix Frankfurter thought that the country wasn't ready. That yeah. as you said, that the yeah. South would so resist uh, striking down the anti-miscegenation laws that it, it should just wait for prudential reasons, mm -hmm. which is the overwhelm, what, what's, I'm glad, aren't you glad you showed up tonight, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> it's, this is a very de sad, depressing topic, but it's <laughs> shocking to realize how widespread the public support for these laws was. And Andrew, that's such a powerful beginning and end of the movie, the Hearn sisters, African-American women, uh, obviously, the effect of these Nixon policies, which were designed to discriminate against the poor, were felt most heavily by African Americans. Absolutely. The second wave was almost entirely people of color and, uh, and, and purposeful mm -hmm. in order to deal with this welfare problem, which is the first thing Nixon said th that he was going to deal with. And by the way, and, 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 and Dan will connect me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, well, they didn't uh, actually bring in a new immigration law that actually got rid of the quotas, I believe, until 1965. I think that was, that was during... 1965, Johnson. 65, so it was... 41 years it, it was the, the law of the land. So it's not just the Supreme Court. It's Congress didn't say this is... Even after the Holocaust, said, oh, no, we're still going to leave all those quotas in place. And I, you know, in the movie, we go back, and a dangerous idea, we go back, and we say, you know what, this is not just 1920s. This is, goes right back to the founding of this country. This country is supposedly based on all are equal, and getting rid of the biology is destiny of the aristocracy in Europe, that or of all the other past recorded history of the leaders, you know, royal blood, and, and you, you know that your your biology determined your social outcome, your social position, even your character, you know, criminal or not. We were supposed to get rid of that. We were supposed to be saying no. But actually, if you look from the very beginning, right, we were biologically that that infected that biological determinism right from the beginning because we said, white men, right. We get all the rights of citizenship. Oh, you're a woman, biology? Oh, sorry. Many of the most basic aspects of citizenship, including whether you can vote, that didn't happen until August 1920. 1970, 1920, okay? And then as far as uh, the slave population or the Native American population, you weren't even people at all right. because of your biology. Yeah. And before we used genetics and eugenics, we used things like you know, craniometry to say the, the, the skulls of you know, black people are yeah. smaller or Native Americans. Yeah. They used phrenology. They used a lot of other pseudosciences before the pseudoscience of, of genetic determinism. So this battle between this founding inequality and the dream of equality is this battle that's been going on from the very beginning, this two and a half, almost two and a half centuries now of trying to get closer and closer to the dream and then all these regressive forces who say, no, we're actually pretty okay without founding inequality. That defends us from any kind of political will to get more equality because it's biological. You can't change that. So this is a, 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 this, these two forces have been at play for a very long time with eugenics only being one very large and important, but as we can see in today's politics, only one aspect of this longer you know, effort of equality and trying to fight against this biological determinism that, you know, versus saying, hey, we are diverse and we can change our destinies and, and everyone should have the opportunity to do that versus being viewed as biologically inferior and not capable of doing that. It's a powerful distinction of biological determinism versus the ideal that all people are equal and can choose our destinies. And you're right to stress just the dark history throughout the 19th century of these genetic distinctions, and in the Civil War exhibit, you'll see the same heroic Justice John Marshall Harlan, who objected to the segregation laws in Plessy versus Ferguson, the lone dissenter from the court's decision upholding uh, segregation laws in 1896, says, uh, of course, we're not arguing for complete equality. There's a, a great race over in uh, the Orient, they're known as the Ch 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 Chinese, and we've got to keep them out of America, and the immigration laws don't allow Chinese people in, and that's good because they would really harm American integrity. It just, the mind spins because it's, the history is so unfamiliar, but it's urgently important to learn it, and you're all eager to learn it, and look at all these wonderful <laughs> questions, and I know our panelists will be as blown away as I always am by the rigor and excellence of the questions from the audience. And here I'm going to just ask, oh, they're so good. Um, well, the, the first, oh, you're going to, oh, and we only have, okay. 
So the, the first one is, uh, Daniel, I'll ask you, since eugenics was a cornerstone of progressivism, how can we defang the idea that progress is always good and, and say more about the fact that the progressive religious denominations, Jewish, Christian, and Protestants were enthusiastically pro-eugenics. It was only the more conservative denominations that I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, yeah. the, uh, the, what we call progressivism today is a different animal from the progressivism where the word was coined. Um, progressivism then, which, which sought to improve society, uh, was profoundly anti-democratic. It was the smart people and the rich people who, it would, who would decide how to improve society. Uh, Margaret Sanger, her, her part of her eugenic campaign um, was, well, look at these slums. The slums are terrible. If we you know, give them birth control, then they won't reproduce. It wasn't directed at the women on Park Avenue. Uh, so to make the, the leap from, from our, that situation to our current situation is, for me, a, a difficult one. I think that there is the lesson of always questioning expertise. However, right now, I'm really dependent on expertise to keep this planet from burning up. Um, so it's a confused, and as you can see, I'm very confused about it and can't answer your question at all. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the right wing, we're also, this is a unique bipartisan effort, eugenics. Because you had the Leslie's, you were saying that social Darwinists tended to be, I mean, Carnegie, we talked about the Carnegie Endowment. Carnegie actually went to England to get Herbert Spencer and bring him to the United States. So this is this right-wing, laissez-faire, no regulations, don't, don't you touch our businesses. They had their own reasons for getting into this. So it was a, you know, it was, it, the progressives said, we're gonna clean the slums, we're gonna clean the outside, and we're gonna clean people's inside. You know, that, they had the arrogance to say that. The, the laissez-faire people said, hey, this is social Darwinism, we are gonna do the, you know, the Lord's work here by just making sure that those workers and those people, and by the way, we don't want the Italians in because they tend to you know, do labor unions and the Irish, we, they tend to be anarchists. We, we want nice people who are gonna obey, you know. If labor but, unions were very anti-immigrant, very strongly, yeah, as yeah, they are, remain yeah, today yeah. to a large degree. But you were telling me, Dan, that uh, Irish uh, uh, American uh, urban ones did oppose it, and a questioner asked, were there any religious leaders who spoke out against eugenics? And I gather, Paul, that some of the conservative denominations did speak out the Catholic against Church, it. You know, definitely. this is a very difficult thing to parse in, in a clean way. Um, there's a series of words here we use that have tremendously broad meanings, progressivism being one of them. Historians can't really agree what that was. There's a lot of brands at different times. It morphs into different things. Same thing for eugenics. Eugenics is enormously popular, not because of sterilization, not because of the things we know about from Hitler, but because it was the promise of healthy babies at a time when babies died one in six in England. Um, so it's very difficult to wrap your head around what the word meant to average people. But I think that the issue of was this a left-right thing, was this a Democrat-Republican thing, was this a, a conservatives versus liberals, it's, it's impossible to do that too. I recently finished a piece that that identifies by name every person who introduced a bill and every person who sponsored a bill that passed for sterilization, so there are 32 of them, and every governor that signed one or vetoed one. And they break out roughly equally between Democrats and Republicans, <laughs> between left and right, between people who call themselves progressives and people who didn't. So it's very difficult to tease it out that way. I don't, I don't think that I, that I could put my finger on it and say, and the religious side, I, I would say the same thing. There is clearly a, um, a pushback from Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism that is subdued up until the 1930s. The Pope comes out with an encyclical and says, this is no good, we don't want sterilization. And everyone else gets in line. But before that, there's a little bit of movement. But the Roman Catholics are the one, the one group that are the clearly the most against um, eugenics in the early years. And very pro-immigration. And well. very pro-immigration because you're actually talking about people who are coming from those countries like Italy. Uh, those of us who, you know, go back to the old country to see these places, that's a good point to make, Dan. <laughs> uh, in any event, I don't think, I think that um, we have had some excellent uh, research and, and writing on the mainline Protestant groups that supported eugenics. And we've, we've also started to get some, some really uh, pointed research from people in the evangelical movement who are writing about the history of evangelicalism and eugenics. Uh, and it's clearly, uh, not, it's more complex than we could summarize in 10 minutes. <laughs>
there's same, a history same. of socialists supporting eugenics. We think of socialism as progressive today, yeah. but uh, it was uh, con conformed with eugenics in the past. I think, to me, the question is, what is your position on the relationship between biology and social inequality? And that is a question that scientists today, whether they're liberal or conservative debate, is social inequality caused by innate biological differences, or do, does social inequality come from structural inequities? Uh, and exactly whether we can determine someone's social position based on their genes, there, there is a resurgence of interest in that, and a lot of that interest is on the part of who we would think of as liberal scientists today. So, and, and, and among those liberal scientists, there's quite a debate about it. And so uh, sometimes those liberal scientists sound a lot like the conservative scientists who used to say that uh, people are poor or otherwise disadvantaged because of their genes, uh, but they would distinguish themselves, the, the liberal ones, from those. So it does get very complicated, but I think we have to ask ourselves, what is required for social justice? What's the ethical approach to this rather than assume that someone in one political party or the other is going to hold that position because you can't know for sure. There, there, there's, so, I, I, there's just so many good questions that I want to put a few more on the table. Uh, and, and this one is for you, Andrew, because uh, it's raised by the film. What constitutional or legal uh, interpretations did Judge Gassell rely on in forcing the Nixon to, administration to stop its sterilization? Great question. Yeah, it's, it's good. just quickly, in the film, uh, you saw Ruth Hubbard, the late Ruth Hubbard, yeah. who's one of the great scientists. Yeah. We have these great scientists in the film who completely take apart this, the pseudoscience of, of a gene for intelligence or a gene for poverty. And by the way, we talk about the Great Society programs with Sergeant Shriver leading the war on poverty and the other welfare things we talked about and, and the other programs in, uh, that were so extraordinary, including legal services, those of us who are lawyers love that, 40% drop in poverty. Well, nobody was genetic engineering. It was a 40% drop in poverty because of social programs. So if you want an answer, it's not like it's not available. It, it's there. I agree. So, so let's just you know, look at the facts. And versus, as I said, we take apart with these great scientists all this nonsense that you're hearing today about genes for this or genes for that. Yeah. It doesn't, it's, it's all pseudoscience. But the Ger Gazelle, actually, he took apart the government's arguments. The government argument said it's perfectly OK to have a parent consult for a minor or have a parent consult for, for a, a, somebody who's not confident at a certain age not confident. You said, why? How's that true? No, that's not consent. So the answer is no. You don't get to sterilize them at all, which would have meant no sterilization for the Ralph sisters, right? And then for the other people, it said, no, they have to, be, they have to consent. Weinberger's ad hoc regulations that the gazelle was looking at. And he said, well, wait a minute. You say consent. What if you're consenting because you're being coerced because they're taking away? You need to say, not only no, consent, no coercion. I mean, so he lays out what those rules have to be and says no more dollars. But I love the way he sort of said, wait a minute, you, that's not consent if a parent consents for, and there's a later case, by the way. But, it, you know, uh, and it's certainly not consent if you're coerced into consent. consent. So it was, it, that, that's the, the sort of the gravamen of, of his, his decision. Okay. Uh, Dan, you started with Queen Victoria, and this question asks, can you separate social Darwinism from the teachings of Charles Darwin? Well, one of the interesting things is that Charles Darwin never heard the term social Darwinism. Social Darwin, uh, uh, Herbert Spencer never heard the term social Darwinism. That's really an invention in the 1940s, first used by Richard Hofstadter, uh, in fact. Uh, mm. the, uh, Spencer precedes Darwin. Spencer writes uh, his social statics, I think, in 1851, 1852. He says survival of the fittest. That's his phrase. That's not Darwin at all. So that, that's just, I, I bring it up to indicate that there was, there was a, 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 a bubbling ferment that was challenging all sorts of, you know, of, of, of accepted fact and accepted social policies. Spencer also said, you know, every, and this was very common among the American eugenicists the, the, uh, uh, on the right, he said, you know, every penny we, we spend on charity is only perpetuating the inferiors in our culture. And, we, and ch charity itself is destroying what we have. It's, welfare is a terrible thing. Uh, so so in, in, in this period, you, you have a struggle, a quest, 
for finding answers through analytical means that had never been used before. Some of the answers they found were phenomenally great, Darwin, and some of them were really terrible. Great, great to remind us about uh, Herbert Spencer and social statics. And Holmes, of course, in his Lochner dissent also memorably said, the 14th Amendment does not enact Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics. And you see that Holmes's incredible gift for aphorism, which served him so well in Lochner, doomed his reputation in Buck and Bell because the three generations of imbeciles line has unfailingly defined him. I just want two more questions on the table. We've got to do it. One, there, there are two on Buck, and we'll give them to Paul. Is Buck the 20th century equivalent of Dred Scott in Supreme Court history? And, 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 and did uh, Butler dissent because of his Catholicism? Uh, I, I would be happy at, at putting uh, you know, Dred Scott and Buck in the same hall of shame. Um, I, think they, I think they both qualify in different ways. Um, as to Butler, I mean, I write in my book that, he's, that Butler's a peculiar character in lots of ways, but the, the story that, that, uh, that I found about him, which I didn't know before I wrote the book, was that Butler had a brother um, who became quite wealthy and apparently had a child by a servant girl who was in his home who was, who was uh, spirited away so that nobody would know about it. And when his brother died, Butler, the justice, was the, uh, was the person who was the executor of his will. And all of them, and this, this hit the newspapers, it became a great scandal, and she was finally paid off and sent away. The most of the money went to the children um, uh, um, of, of uh, Pierce Butler's brother. So that's the only inkling we've ever had of, of a reason, and I'm not sure what reason there is there. Maybe he felt, you know, we could, we could speculate, but it would only be speculation that, that he had some soft spot for people like Cary Buck, um, who had been raped and... But, but wouldn't, isn't it simple enough to think, just as a, the, the Catholic opposition to abortion, is that the state can't interfere in the process of reproduction, it, it's period. Certainly, it certainly is, except that we have, don't have any evidence of that either. And it's 1927, not 1931. Oh, you want evidence. You're a law <laughs> That's true. That's true. All right, we have one minute left. And this is a very large question, but it's the subject of Dor Dorothy's paper. So the last word will be to you. And it's the important question. Are designer babies the next step of eugenics? <laughs> well, I think that if we think of designer babies as being the solution to social problems, it has those same flaws. And also if we think of what the images of designer babies, what, are, what makes a designer baby, what makes a perfect baby, we see the importation of all of these racist and sexist and ableist notions of what is a perfect child. Just look at the pictures. If you Google designer baby, you're going to probably come up with a baby with blonde hair and blue eyes that has some indication they're super smart, they have a high IQ, and they don't have any disabilities. And I think we really have to question, what are we saying? when we call that baby the ideal, what are we saying about children that don't meet that ideal? And also, how is that an answer to the problems that we're facing as human beings? What about social change? Will this replace social change? In addition to all the questions of who will have the ability to have autonomy over creating these babies, and who will have the, the resources, the money, to be able to do it. So there are so many questions of inequality and ethics that go into the very concept of a perfect baby that are very much parallel to all the trouble we've been talking about today about the dangerous idea of eugenics. Ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution is not always for the cheerful, but, <laughs> but for educating us about this dark but crucially important period in the constitutional history. Please join me in thanking our panelists. And now, please go outside and get an early copy of Dan's phenomenal book, oh, which he will sign. Copies of it, of it, you have and, 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 and one end of the, end of the DVD. Go buy whatever you can out there and educate yourself some more.